exploring the heart of a man that was troubled. As successful as he was, it did not stop him from having a problem. As we look at the verse, the Bible says he was great, he had honor and all of that, but at the very bottom of the verse you see, but. And all of us have those, those, those inserts there where we might have all of these things we can celebrate and say, but there's a but there. And that but usually comes with something that in and of ourselves we can do nothing about. His just happened to be leprosy. But I've studied the Bible and studied scripture a little bit. I found out leprosy was an incurable disease to the nation of Israel. If you had leprosy, you would just do. You could not even associate with common people, everyday people. You couldn't live in a walled city unless it was uh, not walled and surrounded. And even if you did, you had to wear a certain garment. It had to be ripped. And you had to notify everyone that you were unclean. You could not just walk openly in public unless you did so. Very embarrassing, very humiliating. Naaman was a Syrian. They did not treat leprosy the same way as the nation of Israel did. He was a mighty man, served in the army, and they, they didn't mind his problem as long as they could benefit from his life. Just so happened it was the custom of them when they would have uh, uh, wars and they would conquer. They would, they would actually take uh, people back into their land. When they go and conquer kingdoms, they would ravage through and take what they wanted. Sometimes they would take people and make them their servants. Well, they took a young lady who they brought back to Syria, and she became Naaman's wife, Naaman. The Bible says, even though I don't show it to you here, the Bible says that she told her about the man of God. She said it like this. She said, look, if your husband, if your husband was back in our land, we got a preacher that can handle this, a prophet that's close to God that can hear him. Well, when you got a problem so bad and you hear that kind of news, it draws some interest. So not only did he go and tell the king, the king decided I'll send you along with a whole host of people so that you can get healed. When the king got word of this, what's tucked in this story is what many people are, are used to hearing. Second Kings chapter 5 and verse 8, when the king of Israel heard the story, he got, he got so scared and so enamored with the idea that this man would want to send this man in to do something I can't do. Some say he was out of touch with the same testimony the young maid had. For she boldly proclaimed that God could heal him. He thought because King sent word, he rent his clothes, which was a sign of astonishment in that day. He rent his clothes and saying, wherefore hast thou rent uh, uh, your clothes? Because he thought the man was seeking an occasion to start a war by sending Naaman to Israel with a letter saying, I want you to heal him. Back in those days, those kind of commands, if not followed through and not treated unlikely, it would ignite a war. So the king read his clothes, as we see here, and really was struck with fear. Elisha. When he heard about it, he, he said to the king, why have, would you do this? Don't rent your clothes, let him come. He shall know there is a problem. Now this is good information. He's about to help this man who needs to know the power of God and the working of God, that God is able to do things in his life. So he says this, and this is a wonderful statement in the latter part of verse eight. He says, let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. The most popular part of this story, many of us already know, is that he didn't even go out to meet him. Naaman came, stood out at his door, and Elisha sends him a message. He didn't even come out there. He didn't look him in the face. 
He didn't know how he looked, didn't care how he looked. He just wanted him to learn who God is. So he come out there and he told him, he sent a message. And he spake unto him and said, look, I want you to go wash in Jordan seven times. Have anybody in here heard this story before? Go dip in Jordan seven times. This man began to get really irate and got mad. Because in his mind, he had it figured out how this deliverance was supposed to take place. That not sounding familiar to us. Have we not got it figured out how God's supposed to move for us? Come on, don't we got our timeline and what should be happening by now even? And how it should even go down? We got it. Some of us have even wrote it down. Somebody told us to write it down and chart it down. Uh, he, he gives him a simple instruction. And the Bible says he got upset in verse 11. The Bible says Naaman got wroth. That means he got angry and went away. The scholars believe as he went away, he was actually turning to go back to his native land because he was just that upset that things didn't go the way he felt like God should have him go and finish. I want to talk to people that felt like God maybe has disappointed you and has not done the things the way you feel you should do them. Your way is not his. Leave God room to be God as you pray and as you want things. Because he might do things totally different than the way you're looking. I, I, I myself, you know, I'm, I'm one. I don't like for things to get totally blowed up before they get better. I'll be honest with you. I don't. I, I don't like the things. But sometimes God waits until they blow up. Then he moves. I like them to move on the first day I pray. I'll be honest with you. But God don't do that sometimes. I just like you have been backed up in that corner where I've had no other choice but to wait. And waiting sometimes can be the most difficult thing. This kind of instruction the man gets mad. The Bible said he said, I thought, now listen, I talk to a lot of people. And when I hear people telling me what they thought and how they feel, I get nervous. You're not supposed to be thinking. You're supposed to trust God. You're supposed to let God do the work. And I hear people tell me, well, I, me, I felt. God don't care about our feelings. He care about his glory. He cared about what he wanted us to know and know him through. So here's a situation where Naaman, he's upset because he thought, and he thought that he would come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord and just lay hands on him and get better. Don't that sound like these guys today? And here he is arguing because he received a simple instruction. Go watch and join the seven times. What's complicated with that? Well, when it challenges your pride, it's very, very challenging. Something's wrong with that. Go wash in Jordan. It's amazing how a simple instruction can get us so twisted up. Even the plan of salvation today, you tell people how to be saved and they, they, they feel like you haven't told them enough because we haven't complicated it. Haven't we done a good job at complicating things when the Bible says just faith, by faith alone are you saved? We tell you, yeah, you can believe, but you got to do this, do that. You got to go here, you got to do that, you got to do this this way. When the Bible says by faith are you saved through, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works. The amazing thing in this story that blesses me, for those of you who know the story, is that someone was loving enough to speak up to him. Someone was loving enough to give him just the encouragement he needs so that he can get the help he needs. You've come a long way to end up being stubborn and turn and walk away. My Lord, come on, you came. You came for a reason. You're going to let just a simple instruction turn you around? Don't be that evil, man. Don't be that messed up. You got a problem that if you go back home with, it's going to kill you. Leprosy eventually ate down to your bones. You died from it. It was an incurable disease. 
If you are exposed to an opportunity that can change it and you're going to get upset because of the way he said you got to do it, come on, you got to think past your pride. So the Bible says in verse 13, his servant came and got in his ear. And I thank God for those God has put in our ear that will give us some encouragement and speak some sense into our mind. He says, look, man, in verse 13, he spake unto him and said, my father, which is a tender entreaty. This is the way people with respect came to people of a higher degree. He calls them a father because he was a respectable figure to them. He said, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Come on, man, this is what you came for. You came to get delivered. You came to get help. Maybe it's not coming the way you thought it would come, but hey, you came for that. If it's here and it's been presented to you, my soul, don't you go back home the way you came. Yeah. You've come too far to just go back the way you came. There are people in this room, your life is more than you want it to be. And there are circumstances and situations you don't want showing up on the screen, but you came here. Yeah. And maybe this service is not all you thought in your mind. It ought to be but the same God. That made a way for you to get here. That's a way for you to get a hope that will give you the ability to face tomorrow. He said, look, man, if he had told you to do some great thing, you'd have did it. How much rather would you then go wash, like he said, and be clean? And I thank God for those that can speak some sense into my mind. I thank God for those that can help me come to my senses and realize I can't do nothing about my sin. If I go back, I'm going to go back in this situation. I need to stop long enough to listen. Thank God for those who help us to come out of our senses while we deal with the dilemma of our lives. Because if not, he went on back in his rebellion. So the Bible says, verse 14, he, 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 he followed the instruction. He went down, dipped himself seven times, and lo and behold, a miracle. He comes up clean. Now listen, God will always challenge us in the areas we least expect or suspect. He'll come against our pride. He'll come with an instruction, and you have to follow it through. And here, the structure was seven times in joy. Can he get clean if he come up five times? No. He has to follow the instruction. Can he get clean if he dips six times? No. He told him seven. God's perfect number. He comes up the seventh time according to the saying of the man of God. Now, you can't tell me the devil won't work on your mind while you're doing something like that. And everybody watching you, they're saying, boy, after the first time, ain't nothing happening here. The third time, nothing happening. And I believe with all my heart, he didn't see a result at all until that seventh time. There wasn't no partial, a little bit here, a little bit there. I believe every time nothing happened, the devil had an opportunity to work on him, but he held true to the instruction. And when you hold true to the instruction, when you hold true to what God has said, he's promised and obligated to do his part. The seventh time he comes up, and the Bible said his flesh came again like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Now, what does this do for him and everybody that's watching? The miracle of his life is now becoming the miracle of their life. The miracle of the person sitting next to you becomes the miracle of you as you're sitting next to them. People need to see and know in your life that God healed you of your leprosy. And as people see and watch that, they know that God had to do it. What do we do for these people who are watching this man? Especially those who came. They knew he was jacked up. They knew he was sick. They knew he had the incurable disease of leprosy. And to see him go down in the water and come up six times just to go one more time. And one more time is going to make a difference in his 
life. One more prayer is going to make a difference in his whole situation. Thank God he was put in the state of war and pray one more time and go down in that water one more time because when he came up, not only did he see and know, everybody else around, people, they all watch as uh, my mother, my mother-in-law died. They all were there. She died. The one lady that worked at the nursing home just happened to be fishing with us that day. My mother-in-law ended up at the same nursing home she worked at. And got better. She died right there. They were hitting her with that thing. The guys even, man, they, they hit her so many times with that thing, she had damage in her eyes from it. She died. They saw that. More than me was there. You can't deny the fact this woman came back to life not by anybody doing but the Lord. Anybody that moves that much blood and their heart stops working, they usually call the funeral director. The doctor told us call anybody that might want to see her. And to their amazement, mother's body demonstrated the power of God. And they had to conclude it's a miracle. Oh, what did you know? They had to conclude it was a miracle. That's what I'm telling you. It's good that people see your situation and know that you're going through. It's good they know that your stuff is jacked up like it is so that when you come up smelling like roses like David did, they would have to admit there is a God. And the whole world needs to know that. Everybody here that know my story know I was a well-known, popular drug addict. God healed me. Everybody saw it. My mother called my father and said I was brainwashed. She didn't realize that the Lord had come in and did a marvelous work. This is the focus this man is now having because his life has changed. The miracle has showed up in his life. The people around him know it. He know it. It's a good place to be. So this story takes an interesting twist. Because I want to show you this and I'll move on. Verse 15 says, Now granted now, this is the focus he leads this man in. This is the focus the preacher has. He returned to the man of God. He and all his company. All of them now saw it and stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know. That's it. Now I know. What's the difference? The change he's made in my life. Now I know there's a God. How many people are waiting to see something that radically changes their, their knowledge of God? How many people need to see the miracle of your situation? And God will get glory out of it. And they will have to say, just like this man, now I know. That will differentiate the false from the fake one. The false from the truth. When people see and know, this is the handiwork of God. He, he said, look, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing. Now that he is convinced, he wants to give him a blessing. Now let me tell you, I didn't read it, but in the story, when the king sent Naaman to uh, Elisha, to the prophet, he sent him with so much wealth. He sent him with 10 talents of, of silver. One talent of silver was worth $36,000. He had 10 of them. He had so many talents of gold and changes of garment. According to our modern calculations, he had upwards of a, over a half million dollars worth of goodies he was willing to pay if it took that in order for his servant to get healed. Because that's how valuable this man was to him. And Elisha didn't want any of it. What preacher you know don't want any money? <laughs> Elisha didn't want any of it. You know why? He didn't want to interfere with the impact God had on this heathen who needed to know God. 
He needed to know who God is. He needed to know the glory of God that was revealed. Elisha, he said, look, take a blessing. Elisha is a mature spiritual man. He knows the focus is where it needs to be. He knows this man, he has just admitted, there's no God. All right, here we go. And I tell you what bothers me so much today is when preachers get in the way of the glory of God being revealed in the life of people. Preachers get in the way. How do they get in the way? The same way the story unfolds. This man has come in contact with the power of God, and now he feels the need to pay it off. And Elisha is saying, no, I don't need your bribery. That reminds me of Abraham when he went and rescued Lot, and the king, of, uh, 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 the king wanted to bless him and give him the stuff. And Abraham said, no, you keep your stuff lest you say you made me rich. So I'd rather God say he made me. And when people feel like they own you like that, they hold it over your head, don't they? People feel like they own you like that. They hold it over your head. They'll never let you forget they paid a little bill, did a little this, did a little that. Keep your money. Let God bail me out. People is something else. Elisha said, no, the focus is where you need to be. You see God at the source, that's where you need to stay. The Bible says in Psalms 29 and 2, give unto the Lord the glory that's due his name. God deserves the glory. You don't give it to somebody else. When God don't get the glory, he's upset. You worship in the beauty of holiness, but the glory belongs to God. Too many people, especially preachers in our day, are trying to rob God. Where they are, they're robbing God of his glory. And though God might do some miracle in through them, they get the glory of it, and next thing you know, they're asking you to do this, do that, give me this, you gotta buy it now. This is shame. Sad part of this is when those in ministry do not have the heart of their leader. This is where this story, in our, my opinion, really takes a twist and shows us how troubled the heart of this young man who has been in the church a while now. This story takes a twist because Elisha is content letting God get the glory. Gehazi our man Gehazi doesn't see it that way. The Bible says in verse 20, he says, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, it doesn't say Gehazi is the man of God, but it says Elisha is the man of God. Gehazi is the servant. He should be learning from his man. He should be taking cues from his pastor. He should be following his pastor's footsteps. If his pastor won't get in the way of the glory, don't you get in the way of the glory. If the pastor says, we don't need to do this, then you ought to take it to heart that you don't need to do this. But Gehazi see it totally different. Look at the verse. He said, my master has spared me. What did he spare him of? He didn't spare him. He just didn't manipulate them like a lot of these preachers do today. He didn't take advantage of him. He didn't merchandise him for his money. Man, you'll never hear me begging for you money. Keep your money. Get your soul right. He didn't do all of the things that we see in our modern day these people do. What he did, he gave the man an instruction, a God instruction that brought a miracle in his life. That's more than enough. I preached a message one time. When was the glory? That was not enough. And I Not receiving at his hand. 
that which he brought. Now look at the covenant he makes in it from out of his heart. He said, but as the Lord liveth, what are we running down today? What are we running after? Mm -hmm. Now people make sure they don't come to church because they don't want to hear you begging for their money. There are people that make sure they don't come and have nothing to do with church because of how you are about your money. I was talking with someone the other day, and I was telling them my desire. And I said, man, it would be great if we could, but it's hard to find somewhere where it's not about the money. It's hard to join in in fellowship somewhere where it's not about the money. Just have some fellowship. Just covenant partner one another. Everything got to be about money. And these churches now have made it where it's like a dynasty. All the money pipes up the dream line to somebody that's sitting way up there and you can't reach them. And if you need any help or anything, they'll tell you you need to trust God. But yet they want you to pay assessments, pay association fees, affiliation fees. My father-in-law was in an organization like that and there's countless many others. And people have concluded it's all about the money. You don't find anybody thinking about the souls. Elisha is worried about the man's soul. There is a time, trust me, I know I'm a pastor. We have to pray right here. I know there's a time to raise the offering. And there's a time to look you in the face and tell you we need some money. Yeah. But that wasn't the time. Yeah. A sinner needs to know who Jesus is. A man who is going back to his heathen ways. This man has already said he's going back to the house of women and he's going to worship. He ain't fully delivered. The last thing you need to do is be trying to merchandise and manipulate them. Continue to tell them about Jesus. Continue to show them the love of God. The glory of God is more than enough. Get out of the way. Gehazi. He says, I'm going to run after it. And boy, are they not running it down. Before I got rid of my Facebook, I had a, a, a man from Africa jump on my chat line and send me a message through Messenger. Guys from Africa are good at this. He didn't know who I was. He said that he could see there was a demonic stronghold over me, and the only way I could get it loose was I had to sow a seed to him right now. I had fun with that. He said he could see this demonic seed that was over my life. And if I didn't sow a seed right now, I said, how much? He said, $500. I said, you don't say it. <laughs> if I don't give you $500 right now, I can't get delivered. And I know who Jesus is. Boy, when I got through with him rebuking him and telling him, I hope and pray he don't pull this here trick on nobody else. And stop trying to break the down feet. Go get a job if you need $500. Stop lying to people. How many people have lost credit with church? This stuff is rampant, y'all. It's all over the place. Africa, America, everywhere. Merchandising people when the glory of God is at stake. What Naaman had was the glory of God in his view. And your head's eyes looking because his eyes and his heart was so troubled, he couldn't see the big picture. He just looking at his pastor who said, that man came with that much money, half a million dollars, and you didn't ask him for one? He spared you. No, he didn't spare him. And I'm telling you, when people come in our midst, some of y'all might think, I let them get away. They didn't get away. They heard the gospel. They might, have, they might not have joined this church. That's all right. They found out who Jesus was. They found out that the Lord lives and he cares of us all. That's more than enough for me, y'all. That's more than enough when all you care about is what God cares about. Naaman said he spared him. I mean, your head's out. He said, my master has spared Naaman. You mean to tell me that's all we about? How, how we can get him? He spared him and not receiving of his hand. Just because I didn't ask you your money, you're going to go run at me. What are we running at? In many of our churches today, prosperity is ruinous. Prosperity is ruinous. 
His name means valley of sight, certainly proved that he lived up to his name, for he's motivated by what he sees. He couldn't stand to see this man get away without running out those material things. If you do not have sight of the glory of God, all that left to see is material things, which produces a lust that made him go after. Produced the lust that made him go after. This man had been taught better. Don't, don't you dare think he didn't know no better. This man watched the shooting like one son get raised back to, from the dead. He didn't try to remember the or merchandise her. He watched them restore. He was with Elisha, a powerful man. He was a servant. He was with them hand and foot watching the miracles, signs, and wonders. He's going the wrong way, robbing God of his glory. Habakkuk says this, Woe to him that increase that which is not his. Look at that. Woe to him that increase that which is not his. But he's running after it. What is our focus today in these churches? Running after that which God didn't tell us to run after. Verse 22 of 2 Kings, not only did he run after him, he's got a twisted heart, troubled heart, and it shows well in this verse. Because when he caught up with him in verse 22, he says, my master have sent me. He was not sent by his master. He was sent by his own troubled heart, his own grief. His own manipulative ways. He went after him. He said, look, my master has sent me, saying, Behold, now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray, a talent of silver to change of garments. Trust me. I said it before and I said it again. I know when there's a time to raise offering. The church to keep going. The church need money. But there is clearly, this is clearly not the time. There is a time when you need to neglect and give God room to work in the life of people. Who desperately need to see God at work, not you. They need it. This man's troubled heart is about to get in the way. And it's going to cost him. It's going to cost him severely. When we speak of matters of the heart as Christians who have been in and around things of faith and maybe you're new to even explore the idea of being people of faith, you don't ever want to get in the way of God's glory. The glory belongs to God. The young minister must be clear. I know when it's time to raise offering and get money. This clearly wasn't a time for it anything, he should have continued the message of his father that he had instilled in Naaman. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 1, he said, I want you to be strong in the grace that is in Christ. And the things which you have heard of me among many witnesses, he said, I want you to commit that to faithful men who will be able to teach others. This man is certainly not doing this what he's doing is causing more damage. He's not being faithful to the glory that the Lord used Elisha to get for himself. This young minister is about to blow it. Verse 23, I'm going to hurry and get through this. Naaman says, go ahead, take two. He gives him two talents. A total of 56000 almost $60,000. And that day, that was a lot of money. He gives him two changes of garments. He takes this stuff, physically moves it back. He comes to the tower. He took them from the servants and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go. It's kind of reminding you of the story when Joshua was having his conquest and they hid that stuff in the tent. 
they can hit it. And it's revealed. He no doubt put them in a place nobody knew but him. But what he didn't know is that God was showing Elisha all the while just how troubled his heart was. God showed him. Verse 25, the Bible said he went in and stood before his master Elisha and said unto him, where you come from, Gehazi? Folks, don't pass that up. This is an opportunity here. When he asked them, where do you come from? Whence comest thou? This was his moment of grace to repent and get it right. Short moment, but this is his moment. This is his chance to become broken over his sin and say, I messed up. This was his chance to right the wrong in his life. When your heart is that troubled, you don't see it as wrong. Your greed hides you from your sin, and your sin gets the best of you. This was a sad moment in the life of a believer who had an opportunity to get it right, and because of his troubled heart, he would. So let's just do some little analysis here while we sit here. You all have a heart, the place where choices reside. Is your heart that troubled? that you don't take the opportunity you have to get it right. Is your heart that trouble? Somebody did you that wrong. You're in that place you can't forgive, but yet you want God to forgive you. Matters of the heart are matters of people. People who might just like your head's eye sit here at an opportunity to get it right. We have to pause at that point. Because this is the pause in his life. Before judgment comes, this is his pause. The outcome not going to go good for you if you don't get it right with God. Fooling with all that other stuff. The Bible says a dangerous and sinful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. One writer said your sin will find you out. The writer said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal. This is your moment. God has brought some of you here. This is your moment. I'm not dooming nobody. I'm not saying nobody about to die. I don't have no faith promise you nobody. But I do know we live on this side of grace. And at any given time, we can come in for an accountability. This is your moment. Where you come from, Gehazi? Oh, my Lord, why did you have to say this? Why couldn't you just tell the truth? Why could you not get it right? You know, when your heart is that troubled and messed up, God is speaking in that tender way and you don't even know he's speaking. So while you in your arrogance saying, no, I ain't been nowhere, God is saying, you broke my heart. Because it's not his will that any should perish. That we all come to repentance. This is his moment to repent, and he won't repent, y'all. His arrogant guy, he said, he said, he said, where you come from? He said, the servant didn't go nowhere. Why do you think God is asking you where you've been? He knows. Folks, when you can't read this and not think about Ananias and Sapphira, God knew what you did. Your husband is already buried. This is your moment to get it right. Because your husband is dead and going to hell. Don't mean you have to. This is your moment. This is your moment of repentance. And, and, and in that moment, his arrogance, because of his troubled heart, got the best of him. And our text picks it up as he says, Whence cometh thou get his eye? And he said, Thy servant went nowhere. He said, I didn't have been nowhere. I've been right here all over our faith. I'm your servant. I'm right here. I ain't been nowhere. Waiting on you. What what Elisha says next is 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 to me is the heart of a pastor. The heart of God. That's what's broken by those who you poured into. 
Some of y'all have been pouring into for a while. Some of y'all have been around me a while. I've been pouring into you. I've never merchandised. I've never manipulated with you. I never had to try with you to raise the money. I never did any of that. All I've done is try to expose you to gospel truth. Don't my heart go with you when you go out? You know who I am go with you? That you represent Christ under this ministry. Well, surely you and surely. Don't my heart go with you? How many of y'all got kids in here? Don't you teach your kids better than what they act sometimes? And if it upsets you when they act different, don't it? You teach them to behave. You teach them the mannerism. And, and, and a piece of your heart is broken when they refuse to live up to the standard you set for them. Because even though everybody else's kids might be acting up, I don't want my kids acting up. We know all so well that speech we had to give. Because when you go to that school, you're not just representing you. You're representing me. You go on that job. Your work ethic don't just represent you. It represents the kingdom. So if you late every day and struggling and dragging and half doing your work. He said, didn't my heart go with you? Didn't everything I stand for go with you while you went running after? which you should not have went after. It is amazing what is attracting our people in our churches today, and they're running after it. The entertainment houses are full. I try to come and teach the gospel and expose them to the word. Boy, they don't want to hear nothing of this no more. You can't fill a house up now with this. Everybody's running after the show. Praise God. He said, didn't my heart go with you? And he lets him know by discernment, he knew what he planned to do. Watch this. He said, is it a time to receive money to receive garments? How did you know? But look at this. His intentions are revealed because every scholar believes the reason why he mentioned olive yards, vineyards, sheep, and oxen is because these are the things he expected to buy. But all that money he enriched himself with. God said, okay, you want to play that game? I'll tell you what. You're going to have that money, but you're going to need it to go see the doctor because you're going to be sick the rest of your life. You're going to need it to buy clean garments because that leprosy that was on there is coming on you. The Lord gave me this note when I was in my office. A curable heart. This man had a curable heart. He met an incurable disease because Gehazi never let his heart be healed of the sin that destroyed him. So to stand before this powerful man of God without confession was dangerous. The man's heart was damaged from the lust and greed that was hidden in his heart. Given the right opportunity we see just how quickly he turned and run. We must leave the glory where it is. He tells him in verse 27, the leprosy of Naaman will cleave to you. It's not going away. He had witnessed a miracle, undeniable display of God's power. And all he could think about was money. All he could think about was his own greed. This is how troubled his heart was. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You cannot serve God and man. Naaman needed to see the grace of God and the free and abundant blessing he received. Gehazi destroyed it. Much can be learned from this account as I close. Much can be learned. First, the faith of a young servant girl who knew about Elisha. Believe in his power. The distress of a, a, a king who did not even think of Elijah and fretted over his own lack of power. We see the contrast between Naaman and the humbleness and the humility of Elijah. Naaman came to the 
deal with all of his gifts like he can just buy God, pay it off. Elisha had no such finery, just the power of God. Nathan's pride was undoing. Those who serve God do not do so for financial gain, but out of love and simple obedience for the Lord. His greed and deception is warning to us. The Bible warns us, pursuing dishonest gain, the love of money is the root of all evil. We're called to be honest in our deal. Jesus even used the story of Naaman because of all those back in the Old Testament, he was the only one healed of leprosy. Jesus gave reference to that. The Bible says in Hebrews 3 and 12, standing in kingdom of heaven, take heed, this is warning, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart. What is the condition of your heart? Has life made you bitter? Have failed relationships made you bitter? Has outcomes that have been out of your control caused you to feel the horrors of life has come in on you? There is a God who cares. The encouragement is exalt one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This is a very troublesome verse here. Take heed means the warning. This is your warning. This is your opportunity. Guard your heart. Watch over your heart. Don't allow a troubled heart to get the best of you. I was reading a passage yesterday about uh, bad things happening to good people. Bad things do happen to good people, but a faithful God is available to us, even in the midst of what we might see as bad. And maybe it is. Our God is faithful. So take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart. You know it is in departing from the living God. But exalt one another. This is why fellowship and coming together is so important. While we have this day of opportunity, unless we get hardened through sin, and sin will do a number of us, I want to pray. I want you to matter. They go around saying, Black Lives Matter. Well, you know, and I know all lives matter. I'm just a black. God so loved the world. I love that verse. He didn't say just black folks, white folks. He loved the world. God's love is revealed as we, as agents of that love, show that love one to another. It starts at the cross. It starts in knowing that a loving Savior took care of the problem you can do nothing about. A troubled heart is a sinful heart. And until we come in faith to Christ, we're, we're in our sins. And we're going to do by nature that which we do as a sinful person. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. That we might have life. If you're willing to trust him, he's willing to unleash the life to you. As I pray for you and pray for your needs today. As we respond to the word of God, it is my sincere prayer that you will surrender the heart to him and allow Jesus to take place. He said, I stand at the door and I knock. Any man open, I'll come in. Any man. I'm not reserved by what you've done or where you've been or what you might have been exposed to. I have pleaded, come unto me. Every one of you that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Father, we come. Oh, how thankful we are that you and your great love have extended to us the opportunity to bring our hearts to you. Father, I pray that we, as your people, 
that we as those who have heard the gospel today, knowing that you get the glory, pray, Father, that you would move in the story of every believer here. Let glory be with you. There's one among us who don't know you. If there's one among us whose heart is being troubled, you said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. You have provided for the, your people a prepared place for a prepared people. I pray, Father, that we would surrender the heart to you and allow you to do a work in our heart. I pray for every heart here, Father. Maybe there are people here whose heart been broken. Trust is the last thing they're willing to give because they've been abused so much. Maybe there's a troubled heart here that is saying, Lord, I can't see why this is happening to me and why we're at this place in this season of my life. But I'm going to give you my heart. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to look to you the author and finisher of my faith. If you're here and you've been broken, your heart is broken. God is a heart fixer. He's a mentor. He can restore broken things and put it back together. There are people who can witness and testify in this room of a troubled, broken heart. And God is putting it back together piece by piece. God is restoring order to their life. There are people here who knew they were out of control, but the master of the sea heard their describing cry, and from the water lifted them, and they can declare God's love lifted them. Save them, I now. Life is complete. My joy is complete. For I'm saved. Save, Lord, heal and deliver me, and set free. Oh, God, I thank you. For that home that's going through the storm, oh, God, move. For those children who act like they've never had any training, when we have poured into them, move. In our situation, be God. We won't touch it. We won't get in the way. You get the glory. You get the honor. And we'll be careful to give you praise. We'll give you glory. Tell the story of your greatness to us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. God bless you. Amen. You got it.